I was asked to sort of do a broad introduction to machine learning just to make sure that everybody's on the same page. If you've taken the machine learning class before, you would have seen many of these topics. Uh, but I hope you can still uh, get a little bit of a refresher and, uh, um, and get something out of this. So uh, the plan for today is we're going to talk a little bit about the types of machine learning problems that, that exist. We're going to talk about linear approximation, objective functions, and different ways of optimizing these. We're going to discuss bias variance, overfitting and underfitting, and uh, regularization. And one of the threads is going to be that we're going to talk about probabilistic interpretations of these methods, because the probabilistic interpretations really allow us to ground uh, the algorithms and to understand what they do. They don't necessarily always give us the best algorithms, but they give us sort of a good um, understanding. So uh, machine learning is very broad, as, as you know. There are sort of three different types of machine learning problems. Uh, supervised learning and unsupervised learning is what you hear about most of the time. Reinforcement learning, as Yoshua mentioned, is, is on the rise, and there's going to be a day dedicated to it uh, towards the end of the week. Um, supervised learning is perhaps uh, the standard thing that you're used to. You have examples with some inputs and some desired output. You get a set of these examples. Um, and what you're trying to do is learn a function that maps inputs into output of this type. And the goal is to, to obtain such a function in order to minimize loss or to optimize some kind of objective. And we're going to be talking about what kinds of objectives might be good to optimize. Um, and ideally, when you do the optimization, you would like it to work well on all the possible instances, on the distribution of instances that are out there. Unfortunately, you don't have access to this distribution. You only have access to a finite sample of data. And so a lot of the problems that arise and that we need to handle uh, are uh, sort of driven by the fact that only a finite sample of data is available. And we need to uh, sort of make do with that. So this is a typical example of supervised learning. You have some images you'd like to learn. Um, a system that can do face detection and face recognition based on uh, examples of images where there might be faces, there might be multiple faces, and so on. Reinforcement learning is a little bit of a different problem where uh, the signal that you get is not as strong. So basically, you get some training experience by interacting with an environment. Maybe you have a stock market agent that's on the market. It observes values of different stocks. And it can make trades. And it can make investments. So it can do things. It has some actions that are available to it. And there's a reward signal that comes back. For example, the agent might be making money or losing money. So it might be getting positive rewards and negative rewards. Um, however, there's never a direct association between the action that's just been done and the reward that's, uh, that's given, and the reward may well be delayed. And that's sort of what uh, makes this problem quite interesting. Uh, this is a cartoon of an early uh, reinforcement learning signal uh, a system that uh, was done by Jerry Tesaro in the early 90s. This is, think of this as an early precursor to AlphaGo. Um, this is a system that learned by interacting with itself, by playing lots of games, and became the best player in the world at, at TD Gamma. So I'm not going to say any more about that, because we're going to have a lot on reinforcement learning uh, on Friday. Unsupervised learning is uh, perhaps the trickiest problem to formulate. You have training experience in the form of unlabeled data, just stuff out there. And your goal is to find some kind of structure. So, Clustering algorithms, dimensionality reduction algorithms, algorithms that try to get that latent variables uh, in the data uh, all kind of fall into this category. And we often don't have one single correct answer, uh, which makes this problem slightly more difficult. So again, there's going to be discussion during the week of different algorithms that do unsupervised learning. This is just an example that I thought I'd show you of sort of interesting supervised learning going on. This is a, a cancer data set. Genes are measured, and then you do cluster analysis in order to determine if there are certain uh, clusters that are correlated together. Uh, and the interesting thing here is that even though you do this unsupervised, what comes out has correlation with clinical outcomes that was not known before. Um, so that's about the types of machine learning. Now we're going to uh, start introducing a little bit of notation and discussing uh, sort of the broad topics. This is an example of a data set. Uh, this is the Wisconsin breast cancer data set, so it's images of pathology uh, that have been sort of segmented by, by an expert. Um, and uh, the first question that comes out when you're faced with a data set like this is, what kind of input representation do we want to have? 
You could be working with the image and the pixels in the image. You could do some image feature extraction, or you could do something uh, more complicated, like talk to the expert and actually get some features that the expert knows are important. Okay, so in this case, we have some features that have been extracted that are measurements on uh, the different parts of the image. And uh, we have some desired outputs that we're trying to predict. In this case, there's two outputs. One is the outcome, does the cancer recur or not? And then the other one is, if the cancer recurs, what's the time until that happens? So in general, the output, the desired output that we're trying to predict could be discrete or it could be continuous, or in fact, could be more complicated than that. Could be something like a tree or a graph and so on. So just in terms of terminology, when, you, when you're faced with a table of data like this, we often call these columns input variables or features or attributes. We call these columns here that we're trying to predict output variables or targets. And each of these rows in a, is an example or an instance. And um, in this case, we're looking at two specific problems which are kind of um, easier to understand and to work with. One is a problem of binary classification, the recur, no recur uh, label. And then the other one is regression. Okay, so we're just trying to predict a, a real number there. And I'm always going to use x's to denote the inputs and y's to denote the outputs. And I think this will be uh, consistent in the follow-up uh, talk as well. And very often we think of this here as a matrix of data, big X, okay, that has number instances by number of columns. Um, and then the outputs, you can think of them as a vector uh, y. And so the bold denotes uh, matrices and vectors. So now we get to the supervised learning problem. What we want is to learn a mapping from x to y. We're going to call such a mapping a hypothesis. And we would like this to be a good predictor of the output. Okay? And this could be called classification or regression or structured prediction in more complicated cases. Um, and we've already kind of decided on what the input set would, uh, space would be. We've decided on the output space. Um, and now uh, we are choosing a class of hypothesis or representations for these functions h. And so this is a sort of cartoon example. If I have some points, the simplest thing that we can think of is to put a line through these points. Okay? And so here is a linear hypothesis h. The w means that there's a parameter vector w uh, that is um, sort of defining this hypothesis. And we have inputs. And so in this case, we just have uh, a linear combination of the, of the inputs uh, weighted by these parameters or weights. And what we would like our algorithm to do is to determine the best weight vector. Okay? So now how should we pick this weight vector? Well, we should pick it in such a way as to get a good fit to the data. So now we need to formalize what does that mean. And that we do this using an error function or a cost function or a loss function, okay? Or sometimes people call this the optimization objective, in which case you can talk about either loss or sort of the quality obtained, okay? And as I'm sure you know, one of the standard things that people do is to use uh, the sum of squared error or uh, the uh, mean squared error as the objective, which is depicted here. This is just measuring the difference between the output of the hypothesis and the actual output observed in the data. You square this up. And there is a lot of nice uh, reasons why uh, this is uh, kind of a, a good error function when you're trying to do regression. We're going to talk a little bit about the probabilistic assumptions about this in a minute. Uh, but for now, let's just uh, sort of stick with this and say, OK, now we have this, this error function. We have our hypothesis class. What we need to do is to search within the hypothesis class for the best hypothesis according to this error function. Okay? So we chose a hypothesis. We chose an objective. And now we need to optimize that objective. And we need to see uh, how we can do that. And um, one of the things that you're going to see a lot during this week is the use of gradient-based methods in order to do this optimization. Okay, so just like a refresher reminder, you can take partial derivatives of a function. You can take a gradient. The gradient is just a vector of partial derivatives. And so a standard way to do the optimization is to take the gradient and set it to 0. Okay, and that will give you um, extreme points of the function. Okay, so in our case, we have an objective function j of w. Okay, depends on the parameter vector w. 
we can take a uh, derivative of this, we can take the gradient. In this case, because we have such a simple function and a simple objective, you can solve this in closed form. I'm not going to go through the algebra, and you can get sort of the best uh, value of the parameter vector w, and it's got a nice closed form solution in terms of the input and the output. Okay? And this is all good. The solution exists as unique if the columns of x are linearly independent. Um, there are several problems with going this route. Okay? One is that you might have lots and lots of data. So doing this kind of matrix inversion may actually not be feasible. Another problem is that maybe your matrix is actually ill-conditioned. Okay? And the more fundamental problem is that we've used a very, very simple hypothesis space. Okay? So this is the one happy case where you can solve things in closed form. It's great. Most of the time, we won't be able to do things like this. Uh, but this is just to give you a warm, fuzzy feeling that sometimes it does work. Okay. Um, OK, so in general, uh, this is a very sort of simple kind of hypothesis space. So what do we do to make this more interesting? Well, we use a transformation of the input using nonlinear features. Okay? And this case is basically almost the same. We use a matrix phi here uh, to denote uh, the features. So the way you think about it is that you can take the input and map it through a function phi into some kind of space that you want. And now you have a lot of choices about what phi might be. You could use polynomials, you could use Gaussians, sigmoids, uh, Boolean combinations if you have binary features, lots of different things. And depending on the feature space, you will get more complicated hypotheses or more simple hypotheses. These are still all linear hypotheses, not in the input, but in terms of the parameter vector w. Okay, so if we look at, at the uh, hypothesis uh, function h, it's a linear function of w, even though it's not a linear function of the input. And that means that the optimization is still going to be uh, quite easy to do, and we still get um, a closed form. Okay. Um, so the other thing that I would like to point out is that in these uh, sort of uh, linear models, um, we actually fix what the basis functions are. Okay? So you decide ahead of time you want to take the inputs and take polynomials up to degree 2. Okay? Or you decide you want to take Gaussians and you want to take them regularly spaced uh, with certain means and certain variances. Okay? And there's a fixed number of basis functions that does not depend on how much data you actually have. Okay? So that's the flavor of what we call parametric methods. Parametric methods have a fixed size parameter vector the size of that parameter vector is decided ahead of time, and the basis functions are fixed. Only the parameters are moving. Okay? Uh, there are other kinds of methods. Non-parametric methods allow the representation to grow with the size of the data. So nearest neighbor methods, for example, or certain forms of locally weighted regression uh, are non-parametric methods. I'm not really going to be talking about that uh, in this talk. Uh, the deep net methods that you're going to hear a lot about in this week are essentially parametric methods, but with very, very large sets of parameters. Okay, are there any questions or comments so far? We're good. Okay, so now let's look at uh, the problem that's created by the fact that we have sort of a fixed size hypothesis that may somehow reflect or not what we have in the data. Okay. So we have a set of data, okay? The blue points there are data points. And now we're doing some fits through these data points, okay? So here we fit an order two polynomial. You can see that it looks pretty good, okay? Goes pretty close to the points, okay? And we could do an order three fit, okay? Or an order four fit, or an order five, and six, and so on, okay? Which of these is the best fit to the data? Is it this one? Is it this? Is it this? Depends what you mean by fit to the data. <laughs> so that's, that's part of the problem. Depends what we mean by fit to the data. Okay. So what can we mean? Well, one thing we could mean is what's the error on the training set that we're using. Okay. 
And we can do something really good on the training set. We can do this, OK? Uh, we can actually find a high enough degree polynomial that will exactly fit the training set, OK? And the error on the training set is 0, OK? Is this a good fit to the data? Well, sort of our intuition says no, OK? Why? Because it's very wild, OK? It goes to the points, but it seems to have no rhyme or reason. In other words, we're not confident that this kind of fit actually generalizes from the training data that we have to new data that we might see in the future, OK? Probably some other things, you know, maybe order two, order three, might actually be, be better, OK? So this points to a problem of a mismatch between what we would like to measure in the objective of the optimization and what we can actually measure, OK? What we would like to do is to measure the true error on the whole distribution of the data. But we don't have access to that. We only have access to a finite sample. As a result, we can only measure things on that finite sample of data, OK? Now, if all we do is train and test on the same sample of data, then we're going to run into trouble, OK? We essentially get solutions that look like this, where we have um, you know, the training data fit perfectly, but not really good hypotheses, not hypotheses that generalize well. Okay, so this is a really, really important problem in all of machine learning called overfitting. And um, it basically means that we find a hypothesis that fits the training data very well, but does not generalize well to one seen examples. And um, essentially, the nature of this comes from having too many parameters for how much data we have. OK, and we're going to make this a little bit more formal now. Um, a lot of the stuff that you're going to hear during the week is methods to get around this problem when you do have a lot of parameters and not very much training data. Okay. So this is another uh, example. It's a picture uh, taken from uh, Bishop's book of uh, different hypotheses fit through these blue circles. OK. Um, and here we have uh, one specific function. That's the, the green function. That's the, sort of the true function. The points were generated by applying a little bit of noise to that function. And then we do fits of various degrees um, of polynomials. And as you can see, uh, if your degree is too small, okay, you basically can't fit the data. That's called underfitting. Okay? It means that your hypothesis space is too simple, and you cannot represent the true function. It doesn't allow you to represent the true function. If you have a hypothesis space that's too complicated, like the degree 9 polynomials over here, you have the overfitting problem that we've just seen. In other words, you can represent perfectly the training data. You can, in fact, memorize it because you have enough parameters to, to, to memorize it. But there's no generalization. Okay? And so what we would like to have is a learning method that goes in between and finds the right complexity of the hypothesis. And so now we're going to have to talk about how, how to do that. Okay. So this is just to, uh, to give you the definition of overfitting a little bit more formally. Okay. So in general, we have, for any hypothesis, a true error, okay, which we denote by J star. Uh, J star is the expected error when the data comes from uh, the true distribution. Okay. But we don't have all the data, OK? So what do we do? We get a sample of data big D. That's our data set. And so we estimate this true error uh, by a finite sample, OK? Uh, now, the problem is that if we use this finite sample both to find the hypothesis and to estimate the error, we might be fooling ourselves. So we can be in a situation where we find a hypothesis that's better on uh, the data set that we have, that, but which is actually worse when we look at the entire data set. And so we need theoretical and empirical methods to guard against this. We're going to talk a little bit about cross-validation and about regularization as two different ways of, of doing uh, this. Um, how do you know if you have a problem? Well, this is a typical plot that you might see when you have a hypothesis space and you have a com complexity parameter over here. Okay, so here we're going from simple hypothesis on that side to more complicated hypothesis going this way. And you have uh, the error, and you are measuring the error now on two different data sets. Okay, 
the training data set is the one that's used to obtain the parameters of the hypothesis. And the test set is a, test of, uh, is a set of data that's not been used during the training process, so has been untouched in the training process. So this is a fairly typical graph where you see the training error going down as the complexity of the hypothesis increases. And then you see this U-shaped curve in the test error where the test error starts high and then goes down to some good level and then goes up again. Okay? So on that end of the spectrum, okay, when you have very simple hypothesis, you're essentially underfitting. Your hypotheses are uh, too simple. They cannot capture the complexity in the data. So both the training and the test error are high. When you have overfitting, your training error is actually low, but the test error is high because you're not generalizing very well. And what we would like is a model selection procedure or a search procedure that brings us in the happy middle zone. Okay? What this is also telling you is that it is really, really important to have a separate set of data on which you're doing evaluations. Okay? Because otherwise, the training set is not a reliable um, indicator of how well you're doing. So what we will do is we will always take the data that we have and separate it out. Okay? You'll have a training set. You typically have a validation set, which we use in order to train hyperparameters. Okay? So decide what the hypothesis space might be. Decide parameters of the optimization procedure and so on. You're going to see uh, a lot more uh, on this in uh, Igo's talk. And then you have a test set that's not touched in this process at all that you use just at the end in order to establish how good your approximator actually is and in order to compare different algorithms. And sometimes uh, these sets are specified for you ahead of time. Sometimes you have to uh, go through a procedure where you take your whole data set and you chop it up into these pieces and you make sure that the pieces are balanced and so on. Um, in order to uh, obtain accurate estimates of, of uh, how good your hypothesis is. This is a procedure called cross-validation where we take the data and we split it up, um, making sure these tests are, are disjoint. And in cross-validation, we typically repeat this procedure multiple times. Okay? Now, of course, the more times you repeat this procedure, the more expensive the computation is. But I'm not going to be worried about this. Okay? Well, I always encourage you to uh, do this a lot okay? and repeat it in order to get good, accurate estimate of, of uh, the generalization capability. Okay? So now we're going to take a little bit of a look at uh, the error in estimators and what's the anatomy of that error. And how does that relate to this kind of overfitting phenomenon? Okay? So if we have some examples, okay, and let's say that we have uh, outputs that are generated from some true function f okay, plus some Gaussian noise. Okay? Gaussian noise of zero mean and some unknown standard deviation. Um, and now we fit a linear hypothesis okay, to minimize the, the squared error. All right? So we have, we've seen that we sort of have two different kinds of errors that can come in. One is maybe your hypothesis is too simple. It's just a line. Okay? Even with basis functions that are nonlinear, it might still be too simple. So there's a, there's a kind of error that comes from the hypothesis being unable to represent the data set that it needs to represent. There's a different kind of error, which is due to the fact that your hypothesis maybe has too many parameters. Okay, and we run into trouble because we can memorize the data. So there are these, these two sources of error. One is sort of a systematic prediction error due to the hypothesis class. And the other one is a variability uh, that means that if I take a different data set and I fit the same hypothesis, you can see the same procedure and so on, I'm going to get different results. And so now we're going to uh, sort of split this up. Okay. So we can think of what's the expected prediction error at a particular data point x. Okay? And in order to make the analysis easier, we're going to make an assumption that's quite standard now in machine learning called the IID assumption. So we're going to assume that all the examples are drawn uh, um, independently uh, from uh, the distribution of data. And what we're interested in is what's the expected uh, squared error at a given point. Okay? over all training sets of a certain size that are drawn uh, from the probability distribution. Okay? And we are going to try and decompose this expectation into different parts. 
okay, in order to understand what the different components of the error actually are. Okay? So this is just a reminder of uh, statistics definitions. You have the expected value or the mean okay, of the random variable. You have the variance. And you can write the variance as the expectation of the square minus the square of the mean. Okay? And uh, that's just a short proof of, of that statement. So we're going to use this uh, variance definition now to kind of massage this, uh, this big expectation into different parts. Okay? So the first thing that we do is we take the square of y minus h of x and break it up. Okay? And then once we've done that, we can, uh, by linearity of expectation, break up the pieces over here. Okay? And we're going to have uh, three components. Okay? One component here is the expectation of y squared given x, okay? expectation of the output given x. Um, one component here is the expectation of the square of the hypothesis. Uh, and we're going to have to use our variance lemma in order to uh, do something interesting with that. And then we have this component over here, which is expectation of a product. Uh, but because the noise is drawn before knowing the hypothesis, really we can break that up. So the y and the h of x are independent of each other, and we can break that up into a product of two expectations. Okay. So for the first term here, we're going to use um, the variance lemma, okay? Variance lemma says expectation of a square, we can write it as the square of the mean plus the variance. So we just do that here, okay? And here by h bar, we mean the average prediction for x over hypotheses that are fit with multiple draws of this data set, okay? Um, over here, the expectation of y given x, that's just the expectation of the function plus the Gaussian random noise, so it's just the value of the function. Okay? So this is, this is nice. And then for the second term, the expectation of y squared, we again use the variance lemma. Okay? And we get some interesting terms over here. Now we're going to have to look at these terms a little bit more in detail uh, to see what they do. Okay? So here are the, you know, once we do cancellations and once we sort of put squares together and so on, just a little bit of algebra, we get here um, three terms that are kind of interesting to look at. Okay? And I'm actually going to start with this last one. The last term here, expected value of y minus f of x squared. Okay? What is this? Well, we said that... Uh, y is equal f of x plus epsilon, okay? So y minus f of x is just the Gaussian random noise. So the expectation of that, um, in this case, is the noise, okay? Um, in general, okay, whenever we have additive noise, this kind of expectation, this expectation of the noise is a component that is not under your control, okay? We, you know, there could be lots of noise, so long as it's additive, we're not going to worry about this because this is not something that our hypothesis can actually touch. Okay? It's a term that doesn't depend on it. We have here an interesting term, f of x minus h bar of x squared. Okay? So what is this? f of x minus h bar, that's a systematic error. Okay? It's a systematic error between the true value of a function and sort of the average predicted by the hypothesis. And that we can do something about. That's basically controlled by our hypothesis class. So and so this is essentially the square of the bias. Okay? And then the first term here, h minus h bar squared in expectation, that's the variance. Okay? That's telling you how much h varies around the mean. Okay? So the noise we're not going to worry about, but these two terms, the square of the bias and the variance are the ones that are driving the error, and one could be bigger or the other one could be bigger. Okay? And in fact, we're going to have to trade these off, typically, against each other. Okay? So this is another picture where we're showing uh, complexity of hypothesis on the x-axis, we're showing error on the y-axis, 
and you can see the bias square, you can see the variance, bias squared plus variance, and you can see the test error here. Okay? So here the bias and the variance have been computed analytically because it's a synthetic example. Okay? So the error that you see over there is in some sense the best case that you can see. Um, the test error is actually computed on data. Okay? So the test error is higher than the analytical prediction. However, you can see that the test error actually mimics very accurately the analytical prediction. The other thing that you see is that as bias increases, various decreases, and vice versa. So this is a very typical trade-off that we see when we uh, play around with the complexity of the hypothesis space. We make the hypothesis space more complicated. That intuitively means hypothesis is going to have more parameters. The bias is going to go down because we, we can now represent more functions, but the variance is going to go up okay, because we have more parameters, and potentially we might need more data in order to, uh, to deal with this. Um, so this is always a trade-off. Okay? You choose a more expensive expressive class of hypotheses, that means you have higher variance and you're going to um, lower your bias. And uh, typically, this is not a black and white trade-off because it depends on the amount of data that you have. Okay? If you have very little data, you're going to have to tolerate bias because there's nothing else you can possibly do. And if you have um, a lot of data, then we can uh, go for very expressive hypothesis classes. And so part of the sort of deep learning uh, revolution has been, in fact, driven by the fact that massive amounts of data are available. And so we can actually uh, fit these complicated hypotheses. Um, there are also other ways of putting in um, bias control in the hypothesis spaces. We're going to talk in a minute about Bayesian methods where you essentially inject prior information. And that can also help you keep complexity under control. Um, so it's really, it's not the hypothesis that's at fault, okay? It's really the balance between the hypothesis and the amount of data. And so, for example, here you have, when you have few points, you can't use complicated hypotheses. But when you have lots of points, they support the complicated hypothesis and you can, uh, you can use it just fine. Okay. Any questions or comments about these ideas of bias variance overfitting, underfitting? I know this is going by very quickly. You'll have access to the slides so you can actually go through the math if you've never seen this one before. Okay. So now let's go back and talk a little bit more about uh, the mean squared error and why the mean squared error might be uh, a good idea, okay, as an optimization objective and what's its interpretation. So one reason why people like the mean squared error is that it's got a good intuitive feeling. If you have real numbers, if you have errors, the big errors are amplified, the small errors are squished down by using the square. Another reason why people like it is that you can take derivatives very easily, and so gradient-based methods work very well. Uh, there are actually some interesting geometric interpretations of this. Okay? So if you consider linear hypotheses, for example, you essentially imagine that all the hypotheses possible hypotheses lie in a hyperplane, okay, linear hyperplane, and then essentially the mean squared error, finding the, the hypothesis with a minimum mean squared error means that we're finding the projection of the true function onto this uh, space of hypotheses. Okay, so that's, that's kind of nice. Um, I'm more interested in showing you a probabilistic interpretation because this is going to elucidate a, a little bit what are the assumptions be behind using the mean squared error? And what, how do you go about thinking about your assumptions when you choose objective functions? Okay? So we're going to make a probabilistic assumption. Okay? We're going to assume, again, that your output yi is a noisy value that's obtained by using a hypothesis from your hypothesis class plus some Gaussian noise. Okay? So for each example, hw of xi is the output of the hypothesis, epsilon i is the Gaussian noise that we're injecting onto this, and that gives you uh, the yi. And now we're trying to figure out how to choose the best parameter vector. Okay? So now we have a probabilistic system where data is drawn from some probability distribution, noise is drawn from some distribution. We're going to want to find a w that gives us the best fit. Okay. How to do this? Well, because we have a, a set of probabilistic assumptions, we're going to use Bayes' theorem in order to figure out what's the best hypothesis. 
Okay, so what does Best theorem say? It says the probability of a hypothesis given the data is equal to probability of the data given the hypothesis times the probability of the hypothesis. And then in the denominator here is the uh, probability of the data. We don't really care about that because that doesn't depend on our hypothesis. If we just want to solve an optimization problem, it's not going to influence us one way or another. So we're going to kind of ignore the denominator and focus on the things that are here on top. Okay. So what do we have on top? We have P of D given H. Okay. That's the likelihood of the data. And we have P of H. That's a prior. Okay. P of H is a prior on the probability um, of different hypotheses. So now we can ask a more specific question, not what's the best hypothesis, but what's the most probable hypothesis given the training data. Okay, so we think of the learning now essentially as a kind of inference process where the data is evidence and the hypothesis uh, space we want to explore. Um, and so we're going to uh, sort of solve this maximization problem, max a posteriori maximization problem, where we want to find the most likely hypothesis given the data. Again, we use Bayes' theorem, so that means we just want the argmax of P of D given H times P of H. Okay? And so here we've dropped P of D because it doesn't depend on H, and so it doesn't affect uh, the maximization anyway. So now we can make some further assumptions. Okay? We can assume that all hypotheses are equally likely. Okay? That's also an assumption that people often make. And so in this case, what we want is a maximum likelihood hypothesis. In other words, we want to find the hypothesis that maximizes the likelihood of the data. And uh, to do this efficiently, we're again going to make the standard assumption that the data is drawn IID from some uh, distribution. And so we can simplify P of D given H into a product of probabilities of each example given the hypothesis. And again, here we can uh, simplify things a little bit by saying this is the probability of the output given the input and the hypothesis times the probability of the input. Okay? Probability of the input is not under our control. That's the environment. That's the world. It's the data distribution. Okay? And P of Y given X, I, and H is something where, where we've made an assumption. Okay? We've made a Gaussian assumption. So now we do the standard thing. We take this likelihood. We're going to take a log of it in order to not work with products but work with sums. And we get the log likelihood here. We have two sums, log of p of xi and log of p of y given xi and h. The second sum here only depends on the data set, not on h. So we're not going to uh, have to care about it since we're just going to do an optimization. And under the assumption that we have Gaussian noise, now the first part, Okay, the term over here is actually quite nice. Okay, uh, so the li likelihood has the sort of Gaussian um, term here, and we can take the log and um, maximizing this right side here is the same as minimizing the, the mean squared error. Okay, so this is a little bit magical. Okay, we've made an assumption, we've kind of picked the right assumption because we knew it ahead of time. And we went through this procedure, and what we have obtained is that essentially the mean squared error or the sum squared error is a surrogate for maximum likelihood criterion. Okay? Maximum likelihood in general says we want to find the most likely hypothesis given the data under the assumption that all hypotheses are equally likely to begin with. Okay? Um, the other thing that's a little bit interesting about this formulation is that it spells out exactly what your assumptions have been. Okay? The data drawn IID, we had Gaussian noise applied on top of the true, some true hypothesis from your hypothesis space. And this Gaussian noise has the same standard deviation for all of the examples. Okay? So under these assumptions, the mean squared error is the right uh, error function in the sense that it is giving you, it's going to give you the same uh, hypothesis is maximum likelihood. Notice also that if your data violates these assumptions, then in some sense, using the, the sum squared error is not the right thing to do. Okay? In particular, if you have, uh, let's say, standard deviations that depend on the input, okay, so that some examples uh, are affected by more noise than others, then using the squared error is the wrong thing to do. And what you should do instead, if you do a little bit of math, you 
figure it out quite easily, is to weight the examples differently. Okay? And uh, perhaps throw out some examples that are affected by too much noise in order to, uh, to do your fit. Okay? So uh, now I'm going to show you a little picture here okay, to kind of represent this process. Okay? And this is going to establish a link to a sort of a general class of uh, machine learning algorithms called graphical models. Okay? I don't know how much you'll see these pictures uh, during this week, but I figured that it might be a good idea for you to uh, actually visualize things this way at least once. Okay? So this is a cartoon of how the data is being generated in the case of uh, linear regression that we've talked about. Okay? And that are the assumptions that we've talked about. So we have some inputs. Uh, there's a random variable here, x, okay, that's drawn from some distribution p of x. So each node here is going to be uh, some kind of random variable. Okay? Um, and the arrows are going to show sort of influences between these random variables. And at each of these nodes, we're going to have a conditional distribution of that particular node given its parents. Okay? So x has no parents. It's just drawn from some distribution, which is unknown. Okay? Epsilon, the noise, is, also has no parents. It's drawn from a normal distribution of mean zero and some variance sigma that we have some standard deviation sigma that we don't really know. Okay. Uh, w here, under these assumptions that we've used so far, is fixed but unknown. Okay. And so we're going to try to use this model to infer what W might be given the evidence that's being presented. And the output, y, is in fact a deterministic node that does a deterministic operation in this case where it takes uh, the output of the hypothesis that depends on w and x, and that's the noise that comes from epsilon. Okay. <clears throat> so in this case, some of the variables are observed, some of the variables are unobserved. Okay. We can see x and we can see y. But we don't actually see epsilon, nor do we see w. Okay? And we actually don't really know the parameter of the probability distribution that governs epsilon either. So this is going to be a very typical case where you have data, you have some observed variables. You kind of know there are some other variables that are important, but you don't see them. Those are called hidden or latent variables. And a lot of the time we're going to try to build a model that infers these variables their probability distributions and their values from data. Okay? Uh, the other thing that's interesting about this model is that it points out places where we could make more interesting assumptions. Okay? So for example here, we've assumed that W is fixed but unknown okay? because we're under maximum likelihood. But now let's assume that W is actually a random variable. Okay? So if W is a random variable, then it might be drawn from some probability distribution. Okay? Then we're moving towards a Bayesian setting where we actually have priors over the parameters and we can use the data to infer a posterior probability distribution over the parameters. Okay? Um, and of course, uh, here we've uh, made a specific assumption about how the output interacts with the input. Okay? This kind of cartoon uh, is typical of uh, discriminative models where you have the input sort of determining the output in some kind of, uh, of sort of de close to deterministic fashion. But in general, we could have variables interacting in all kinds of ways. Okay? So we could have many variables, we could have arrows going forward and backward and so on. And so you'd get a lot more generality by uh, drawing models in that way. Are there any questions or comments about this? picture about the sort of this graphical model's probabilistic view. Everybody's very quiet. That's kind of suspicious. Okay. So now let's talk a little bit about regularization from this kind of perspective, okay, of, of graphical models. So regularization is a way of controlling the bias variance trade-off uh, in order to obtain a, a good value of the straight off. And it essentially, sort of getting to the punchline, it boils down to controlling 
uh, this W here through some kind of prior, okay? Uh, that is going to help us inject some bias, but perhaps mop away uh, some of the variance, okay? Now, what does regularization usually look like? Uh, it looks like this. We have our initial objective, which is JD of W. That's to optimize something on the data, either minimize squared error or maximize likelihood or something like this. And we add to it a penalty term, okay? And this penalty term depends on the weight vector. And the penalty term essentially captures some kind of intuition that we have about priors on the hypothesis space. What hypotheses are better than others in the absence of any data? And the parameter lambda over there controls this trade-off. So the higher I make the lambda, the more we pay attention to the penalty. The lower we make the lambda, the less we pay attention to this penalty. If we set lambda to zero, then essentially we just try to optimize performance on the data, and we don't care at all about uh, the actual um, prior on the hypotheses. So in statistics, this is called shrinkage. In machine learning, we call this regularization. And lambda here is called regularization coefficient. Um, and uh, in principle, you have um, criteria that can help you select this. And in practice, very often, people do cross-validation and treat this as a, as a sort of hyperparameter as well. So now let's look a little bit at regularization for linear models. Okay, so here we have a linear model. We have the error function. And then we have uh, here a term, W transpose W, that is what's called L2 regularization or weight decay. Okay, so what does this do? It basically says that we would like our weight magnitude to be small. Okay, because if we emphasize this term and the weight magnitude is high, this is going to make things look worse. Okay, so that's why weight decay. Okay. And the nice thing about this is that, of course, here's a quadratic term. In the front, we also have a quadratic term. So everything is nice and quadratic. And we can take gradients, and we can optimize. And uh, things work very well. In fact, they work very well in closed form. And we get this uh, solution over here, where the best weight vector has basically the same form as before, except phi transpose phi has a lambda times identity matrix added to it. Okay, So in other words, you're adding mass on the diagonal of this phi transpose phi. Okay? That helps you uh, with two things. Okay? It helps you with making this a little bit be better conditioned. Okay? And again, it sort of drives uh, your weights towards zero. Um, and of course, if lambda is equal to zero, you get exactly the same solution as for usual linear regression. And if lambda goes to infinity, then the solution is just going to go to zero. So this is called ridge regression. There's a more general class of regularization, which actually I'm not going to tell you about, really, called Tikhonov regularization uh, that has all, all this kind of form. Okay? And um, sort of uh, a, an alternative view of this, okay, um, which is derived in the slides, but I'm really not going to go through the derivation, is the following. We could think of this criterion and as saying we have some objective function here, which is the squared error. Okay, we're trying to minimize that. And at the same time, we want to keep the magnitude of the weights bounded. Okay? And this parameter eta is sort of the inverse of lambda. Okay? So what does this mean? Okay? How do we visualize this? We basically do the following. In general, we would like the weights to be close to zero. Okay, so you have this red circle over here around the origin that's saying, I want the weights to be small. Okay? And we have a sort of uh, point over here that's the best fit based on the data. Okay? Now, what is the best solution according to this criterion? Well, it's where these circles intersect. Okay? And that that's going to be on the sort of line that unites uh, these two centers. Or you know, if you're in many dimensions, it's going to be a hyperline. So now, what happens with the regularization? If I, if I uh, make lambda very small, OK, eta, which is 1 over lambda, is very big. And the circle that's around the origin is going to blow up. OK, and all solutions are acceptable, essentially. Okay? Otherwise, when we shrink the circle, OK, we really want the weights to be close to 0. That's the emphasis. And so the weights are going to migrate away from the point that's best for the data towards the point that's best for this, this prior. OK? 
Okay, so that's L2 regularization. So this is actually quite nice, okay? If you find a good value for the regularization parameter, this helps you avoid overfitting. Um, if there are irrelevant features in the input, then uh, you're going to get small weights for those features, typically, okay? Uh, without having to do some kind of complicated pre-selection procedure where you just keep some features and so on, but their weights are not going to be quite zero. Okay, they're going to stay a little bit away from zero because there's nothing really encouraging them to be all zero. Okay, we're working with the magnitude of the weight vector rather than particular weights. So there's a way to, uh, to actually get these weights to be equal to zero. Okay, that's called L1 regularization. Okay, and I'll actually show you the picture first. Okay, the picture for L1 regularization is that instead of using a circle around the origin, we use a little diamond. Okay. And so what we require is for the weights to be inside of this diamond. Okay. And so now uh, you have the circle here. It's going to touch the diamond uh, somewhere along its edges. Okay. But one can actually formally show that you're more likely to touch at the corner than to touch in the middle of an edge. Okay. Now that's actually kind of nice because here, if you're touching at the corner, that means that one of your weights is actually zero and only the other weight matters. So if you have irrelevant features, then those irrelevant features essentially will have zero weights and they'll be thrown out. So this is a large class of methods called lasso, very popular in statistics community, works very well with linear approximators, doesn't work so well with nonlinear approximators because this kind of constraint is actually a little bit ugly, okay? Uh, and the optimization procedure is uh, significantly more elaborate. Okay? The type of constraint that we have here is that the sum of the absolute values of the weights has to be bounded by a parameter eta, and eta again controls the size of this diamond. Um, so you know, why is this more complicated? Well, you can easily see that if I take this absolute value and expand it in all possible ways, we get a blow up of these constraints. You still have a sort of, in principle, a nice optimization procedure, but with lots and lots of constraints. And so um, where is this uh, useful? Well, that depends. There are some things that, that go in between, where people use sort of L1 style regularization in some parts of the space and then smoothly go into an L2. These are called Huberized losses. Um, in, some, in some cases, those work um, better than either L1 or L2. The advantage of L2 is that it eliminates completely uh, features that are irrelevant, and so in some applications that's actually useful. So for example, if you work in medical applications, uh, doctors really want to know what are the three different symptoms that are uh, determining the diagnosis or the five different genes that are determining the diagnosis, and they don't want everything else to be around. In other applications, this is not so important. And this is just to show you uh, sort of visually the effect. So this is L1 regularization, this is L2 regularization as we vary the strength of the regularization parameter. Uh, of course, in the end, everything goes to zero, all the weights go to zero. But as you can see, in L1 regularization, certain weights just go to zero and stay zero, okay? And you can consider that the more important variables are the ones that are lasting longer, okay? Whereas in L2, everything kind of goes to zero roughly at the same time, and so it's harder to determine which of these things actually has to be thrown out. Okay. So now what's the Bayesian view of this? The Bayesian view is that in both of these cases, we really what we're dealing with is a prior distribution over hypotheses. Okay. And when the data comes in, we compute a posterior distribution. And the uh, difference between L2 and L1 is what kind of distribution do we assume as the prior? Okay. So in the L2 case, we have a circular Gaussian, that's the prior. And so when we compute the posterior, we also obtain a Gaussian distribution, okay? And so for that reason, it's actually very easy to work with L2 regularization in many cases, and it leads to all kinds of interesting algorithms, Gaussian processes, and so on. In the L1 case, what we use is a double exponential prior, okay? And that corresponds to this kind of diamond shape, this sort of uh, goes out much, much quicker than a Gaussian. Um, and uh, so as a result, you sort of put in a little bit different kind of prior knowledge, and so you're going to get slightly different hypotheses when you do your search. This is something that is under your control, 
And the choice is really guided by two criteria. One is um, the ease of the optimization, because working with, for example, with conjugate priors uh, really makes things easy from the point of view of solving the optimization problem, or sometimes choosing uh, sort of smoothness in the prior and smoothness in the error function makes uh, gradient-based optimization easier to deal with. Um, and then the other uh, sort of important consideration is what do we actually know about the problem? And so here it's sort of it's easy problems, it's aggression problems, but often when we deal with structured data, the prior actually reflects something that we know about the hypothesis space. Okay, for example, if we're trying to infer gene networks, maybe we know that certain genes cannot be connected and so we can build that into the prior. So this is just to give you a, a cartoon picture of this Bayesian view of regularization. Okay? And uh, what we're going to do here is start with a prior over the weight space. Okay? This is the picture here with the red circle. This is a Gaussian prior over the weight space, and uh, it's sort of centered at zero. Okay? So in the absence of any data, we can use this to draw weight vectors. Okay? And each weight vector is going to be a hypothesis. Okay? And so here, these red lines represent different hypotheses that we've drawn from this prior. Okay? And you can see they're all over the place. All we say is we'd like the weights to be roughly small, okay? but there's no rhyme or reason until you actually see some data. Okay? Now, it's a little bit hard to see, but over here on the right-hand side, in the second row, we have a data point. It's a little blue circle. Okay? And so now what we do when we do the regularization, essentially, is we compute a posterior over the weight space, over the parameter space, and that posterior says we would like to fit the data. Okay? And so all the lines are encouraged to go through this point to fit the point. Okay? So compared to here, where the lines were all over the place, here we have lines that are still all over the place, but they do fit the blue point that we've just gotten. Okay? Now, what does that mean from the point of view of the weights? Okay, what it means is that this Gaussian that used to be round okay, is no longer round because we've taken the round prior and we've combined it with the likelihood of the data. Likelihood is here, okay, this sort of red line. Likelihood says all weights are good so long as they fit this point. Okay? And so when we do that, we get a Gaussian that's more squished. Okay? So on one side, we have to go through this, this data point that we have. On the other side, we still, still have a lot of freedom. So there's still a lot of variance okay, in the weight vector, uh, but we've restricted this somewhat. Okay? So now a second point comes in. Okay? Here's the second point. And now you can see that we want actually to fit both of these things. Okay? So what happens is we take this uh, sort of uh, posterior probability over the weight vector, we combine it with a new likelihood from the new point, and now we have something that's very sort of concentrated in one spot. Okay? And now if you look at the lines that result, they all go roughly through the two points. There is some variability, because okay? we have a distribution. Okay? Um, but they're all pretty well aligned together. And as we get more data, what happens is the spot that tells me what's the best weight vector kind of squishes in, the variance reduces, and the lines get more and more aligned together. Okay? So how does this relate to bias variance? Well, we've put in some bias here through the choice of prior. Okay? And then the data comes in. Okay? And the data is helping to decide how to sort of shrink this in order to actually fit the observations that we have. Okay? And the more data we have, the more we're going to shrink this, okay? And the limit of infinite amount of data, maybe we're going to you know, fit this exactly correctly. So the posterior is always skewed by the data. Okay? So why is this interesting? Well, it's interesting because it gives us more than just estimates of the values of the output. It actually also gives us some kind of uncertainty estimates in, in where our hypothesis is confident on its output and where it is not. Okay? So this is uh, sort of another picture of the same problem, basically. You have these circles here, which are the data points that are observed. The true function is this green function here. 
and we have these red lines that are drawn from posterior distribution over the weight vector. Okay? So what you see here is that when we have a data point, the blue point here, around that data point we have little uh, uncertainty because we know we have to fit it. Okay? Not exactly because we're allowed some noise, but more or less. Whereas when you're away from the data, there's a lot of uncertainty. Okay? Because you don't really know there, you can't really tell what's a good hypothesis. And you can see it in these lines, they all kind of go through the blue point, but they're all over the place. As we get more points, okay, these lines focus in order to capture these points. Outside of where we have data, we still have a lot of uncertainty. Okay? So the moral of the story is that you can always generalize well around where data actually is. If you're working with a Bayesian method, you can actually get analytical estimates sometimes or empirical estimates of this uncertainty. Okay? And you can work with multiple hypotheses at the same time. It is expensive. Okay? And it is uh, somewhat unpleasant in the sense that you can't point and say, oh, you know, this is my function. Okay? Now you have a whole space of possible functions and you can draw from that space. At the same time, you can easily quantify uh, how uncertain you are. And the other interesting thing about this picture is that if we see where the uncertainty is high, that indicates perhaps where we should collect more data. Okay? Now, that's not a setting that's often talked about in sort of standard uh, supervised learning. It's a sort of active learning setting where if we know where uncertainty is, we can actually make a question and ask, okay, we want an example in this area. What's the label of that example? And that can drive the learning. There's a very interesting sort of research question of how to do that uh, well and efficiently. So this is just a picture of continuing this sort of drawing points. And you can see that as you draw more and more points, you still have multiple hypotheses in the sort of Bayesian view because you have a distribution over hypotheses, but they all sort of cluster together in order to fit the data. In the limit, as you have an infinite amount of data, the optimization becomes the same as maximum likelihood. But when you have a small amount of data, the prior has a say, okay? and so the, the hypotheses that you get are driven by both the prior and the data. Okay. So, so Bayesian, the Bayesian view is kind of interesting because it tells us about what are our assumptions. It gives us uncertainty estimates. It can guide active learning. Um, it is tricky, okay, in the sense that uh, if you, for example, overwhelm your prior with data too quickly, then the prior doesn't really help you. It's also tricky because it is um, sort of expensive to work with this sort of sampled hypotheses. Um, but, but it can be actually um, quite interesting. Are there any questions or comments about that? Okay. There will be an exam at the end. <laughs> <laughs> so now the last thing I wanted to, uh, to mention to you uh, is logistic regression. Why? Well, because it's sort of the equivalent of linear regression for classification problems, and Hugo is going to tell you all about how to do this a lot better. But this is kind of the uh, usual statistical view of things. Uh, so here we have a hypothesis, okay? And the hypothesis is a logistic function of this linear combination of the inputs. So x is the input, w transpose x is the linear combination, and then we do this kind of expectation, and you get this sort of shape of your function that goes kind of like this. You'll see a lot more about this uh, later. It's also called sigmoid neuron in the neural net literature. Um, so why is this close to linear? Okay. We're going to interpret the output of this hypothesis as the probability of the class label being 1 given the input. Okay. And so if that's our interpretation, and if we look at the log odds ratio of the probability of the two classes, the binary classification case, y equal to 1 and y equal to 0, you get the weights times the inputs. Okay? So that's linear. Okay? That's the sense in which we have things that are linear. And um, the interesting thing is that if we find the best weights here, okay, the best weights are going to maximize the conditional likelihood of the outputs given the inputs. Okay, so that's kind of nice. It's again a maximum likelihood criterion and it's sort of the sort of standard discriminative setting. Um, 
So now what are we going to optimize? Well, we can optimize uh, the cross entropy. Okay. So how do we think about the cross entropy? We have some distribution of observed outputs in the data, and then we have some distribution that's generated by the output of our hypothesis. Okay. We're going to measure how far off one is from the other. Okay. So the log likelihood of the hypothesis here, assuming again that we have all hypotheses being equally likely, we're going to have here a sum of the log of p of y given x. And this is going to be either log of h of x of one, or 1 minus h of x, depending on whether we have class 1 or class 0. We can do a little trick to kind of put these together okay, uh, by using this kind of multiplication of y times the log and 1 minus y times the log of 1 minus h of x here. And so we obtain the, the cross entropy error function. And now we can optimize this to obtain the best um, parameter vector. Okay. So this is a plot of what cross entropy error surface looks like for a logistic function. And you can see that it's nice. Okay, it's convex. Um, unfortunately, we can't really solve it in closed form anymore. Okay, so in the case of linear regression, we obtained an actual formula of what the weights ought to be as a function of the inputs and the outputs. Here we can't quite do that, okay? but it is a nice convex optimization. Okay? And so what we're going to do is to use our best weapon that we're going to use a lot this week called gradient descent. Okay? So just to remind you, gradient descent basically says if we have some kind of error function that we're trying to optimize, uh, we're going to start somewhere and follow the gradient okay, until we get to the bottom. Now if you have something that's nice and convex like here, you can start anywhere and you're going to end up at the bottom under mild technical conditions. If you have a nonlinear optimization objective with lots of little wells, then when you do your optimization, you may end up in a local optimal, uh, optimum, which is a, one of these local little wells. And so there's then all kinds of tricks to encourage you to end up in a good spot. And you is going to tell you all about that. So I won't really discuss that in detail. One of the very standard ones, of course, is to just do this multiple times and just start from different initialization points, and that's going to lead you to different solutions. <clears throat> so what does the gradient descent algorithm look like? You have an ob objective J. Okay? We're going to assume that we can compute the gradient of this objective easily. Okay? So the objective is smooth and the hypothesis is smooth, for example, then this is easily done. And we're going to produce a sequence of weight vectors um, <clears throat> such that the limit of this is some weight vector that's locally optimal. And what we're going to do instead of, so now instead of solving the set of equations that sets the gradient to zero, we're simply going to step in the direction of the gradient. Because this is an error function, we want to step down in the direction of the gradient, hence the minus sign over here. And we have a learning rate alpha that controls how much we step down. And these alpha i's could be different from iteration from, to iteration from step to step. And there's also smart ways of actually setting them. So now we can apply this to uh, the case of logistic regression. We can take the likelihood of the data. We can take the gradient. We can write the update uh, rule for the gradient. And we get a very nice update okay, that basically says we started with some arbitrary weight vector, and then we step. Okay, in such a way as to minimize the error on the inputs. Okay. <clears throat> now, this kind of optimization is all good, but it requires you to pick these learning rates. And you can treat this as a hyperparameter and use cross validation and pick the rates. Sometimes the theory says, of course, you should decay these rates, then you have more things to, to deal with. Maybe you want to decay them in, according to some schedule. That schedule might have parameters and so on. Um, so there's another thing that you can do, which is uh, to apply Newton's method. Okay. And so uh, how does this look like? Newton's method is basically uh, an interesting way of finding zeros of a function. In our case, we want to find zeros of the gradient. Okay? And uh, the idea is that if I have some function, okay, 
and I'm at some point here, we're going to approximate the function um, using a straight line. And then we're going to solve the equation for where this reaches 0, okay, and then move to that point. Okay? And so this is written out here, assuming that you just have a univariate function. But if you have a multivariate function, you can do exactly the same sort of thing using uh, here a gradient instead of, um, of, of a derivative. And so now here, what we want is we want to find the zeros of the gradient. Okay? So on top, our g function here is the derivative. Okay? And on the bottom, we have the second order derivative. Okay, so this is part of a class of methods called second order methods because they make use of second order derivative information if you have access to that. Okay? And then you step in this direction and that's really the best you can possibly do. Okay? So notice that if I have an iteration like this, there's no learning rate and there's no step size. You just do this computation. You, the price to pay is that you do have to compute the second order derivative and that may be expensive depending on a variety of circumstances. Okay. If you have a quadratic error function, then you find the optimum in one step okay, using this method. So this is the multivariate setting here with, where now instead of having a second order derivative, we have the multivariate equivalent, which is the Hessian matrix. So the Hessian matrix um, has the second order derivatives according to pairs of parameters. And so the iteration just moves in the direction of the gradient of the objective. And the learning rate is the inverse of the Hessian. Okay? You do have to estimate this Hessian. Okay? And so typically these methods in order to be used require more data than methods that are just based on um, step size. So this is called newton raphson method, sometimes called Fisher scoring. Um, what's better? Well, that depends. Okay. Typically, this kind of second order method requires fewer uh, iterations in order to do the computation because you sort of take optimal steps. Um, at the same time, you need a batch of data, so it's not an online algorithm. Um, and also, there's this inversion of the Hessian, which, which is uh, expensive. Uh, there are actually tricks for avoiding this kind of explicit computation and inversion, um, which you may hear about later on. Uh, but you can actually uh, do this for logistic regression, and it results in an algorithm called iterative re recursive least squares. And uh, the Hessian has a nice form in this case, where you have the features and then this kind of diagonal matrix of h times 1 minus h. And so the weight updates also become quite nice, and it's, it's, a, it's a good algorithm if you are going to do logistic regression and you can work with these large matrices. How do we do regularization for logistic regression? Well, we do it just the way we do it for linear regression. Okay? We're going to have to put a prior over the parameter vector. Okay? Um, so, for example, we can just do L2 regularization. We can just say we want the, weight of the, the, the norm of the weight vector to be small. Uh, this means that, again, we have a sort of quadratic element in there, uh, and the optimization is easy. It's a little bit harder now to make sense of what's going on in the sense that this is suggesting a Gaussian prior. But then the data comes in and we don't have a conjugate. It's not a conjugate, so we don't really get a conjugate posterior. There are other things that one can do here, uh, different kinds of regularization that perhaps would be better matched to binary data. Okay, so for example, you can consider what is the error, what does the error look like for binary data? Well, typically the error is not a Gaussian type of error, uh, but it's actually flipping the label. And so perhaps working with Gaussians here is not ideal. However, from a practical point of view, this is very nice. Okay? And so that's one of the reasons why, why people use this method. <clears throat> now, what's the probabilistic view of logistic regression? So just like we thought about linear regression and we thought about this kind of noise model, we can treat logistic regression in the same way. Okay, so we can consider the output as being produced by a hypothesis plus uh, some noise. Okay, <clears throat> but this is actually kind of strange. Okay, again, because the output is binary, and so what does this kind of model really mean? Um, so instead, what we will do is we will consider a continuous variable, okay, yi hat, that's produced by the hypothesis plus some noise. 
And then we're going to consider the output being generated by thresholding this variable okay, at zero. So we're going to generate a one if this variable is positive and a zero otherwise. And so in this case, we actually obtain a nice probabilistic model for logistic regression. We now have uh, the, the graphical model is a little bit more complicated. We have the inputs. We have epsilon. These are used to go into this sort of y hat variable, which is then used to generate y. Okay. <clears throat> so again, there's this sort of notion of, of a latent variable somewhere in there that we don't actually get to observe, but that controls the output that gets observed. Now, the other interesting thing about this kind of interpretation is that it directly shows you that logistic regression is not a generative model. In other words, if I just consider the inputs and the outputs, there's not a good way for, for me to generate what this y hat might have been. Okay? And so there are other models, other probabilistic models, that are fully probabilistic that allow you to manipulate these latent variables in, in nicer ways. OK, so we're going to recap now a little bit. Uh, we talked about machine learning algorithms. Hopefully, this was more of a refresher. If you've seen this now for the first time, I'm sure it's like completely whizzed by. Um, <clears throat> so whenever you have a machine learning algorithm, you have to think of making a choice of, of hy a hypothesis, a choice of an error function, and a choice of an optimization procedure. Uh, very often, we're going to make gradient descent kind of optimization procedures just because they're convenient and they work sort of uh, in many, many cases. Um, in some cases, this optimization is easy and in closed form. In almost all the cases you're going to see for the rest of the week, this is not the case. And you're going to have to work harder to, uh, to get that. Um, and all of the algorithms are affected by this kind of bias variance trade-off. Uh, so the overfitting phenomenon is always a concern. You always have to do cross-validation. You always have to make sure that you're not building a model that's too large for the amount of data that you have. Uh, you could do regularization to control that. You can put priors on hypothesis space. And uh, I've showed you a little bit of this Bayesian interpretation. I'm not sure how much you'll see of this for the rest of the week, but I think it's useful to keep this in mind because it both captures what the al algorithms are trying to do, what are the hidden assumptions behind the algorithms, and also it gives you um, a way of perhaps expanding the class of algorithms by modifying those assumptions explicitly. So I'll stop there, and I'm going to take questions, if there are any. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned the cross-entropy error. I heard some people uh, think that uh, it's uh, better than the mean square error for my application problems. Is it true? Uh, why? <laughs> So for binary classification, the mean squared error sort of doesn't make sense because uh, the mean squared error is under this assumption that you have some output and then it's affected by Gaussian noise. Okay? Now, that's not the case in, in binary classification. In binary classification, you have some output, and the nature of the noise is to flip that output. Okay? So instead of one, make it zero and the other way around. And so using the mean squared error in this case really does not fit at all with the nature of the output data. Okay? Cross entropy explicitly says, well, we have some distribution of this output conditioned on the inputs, and we have some distribution of this output that's generated by the hypothesis. And now we're measuring how different these two distributions are. So in that sense, it is a fit for this problem, as well as many other problems. It's a very general kind of error function that whenever you have this kind of probabilistic assumption on the problem at hand, you can work with it. It's just a matter of, in this particular case, the cross entropy also has a nice form that you can actually uh, work with computationally, whereas in other problems that might be more complicated depending on the, on the distribution. Uh, yeah. Right, so the question was, is the, is the cross entropy better than the mean squared error for uh, binary classification? Yeah. So I just wanted to be devil's advocate here. Uh, if you minimize squared error with zero one targets, then you're actually doing something meaningful, which is estimating the expected value of the, the binary variable given x. So it's not completely crazy. But I think the reason it doesn't work as well as the uh, cross-entropy with the sigmoid 
or a softmax is, is more numerical. That, uh, if you want your output to be bounded between zero and one, you have something like sigmoid or softmax, and then if you use squared error, you end up with uh, problems where uh, derivatives might be close to zero even though the, uh, the output is confidently wrong. And this is a bad situation. So there's certainly a numerical aspect, but at least from my point of view, you know, I, I would like the interpretation to be consistent with the with the choice of algorithm. And so, in this particular case, so if you want to do know, like you, then this is the right thing. Exactly, exactly. Now, there is a there is a debate of whether maximum likelihood is the right thing to do, <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> that's that's a whole big debate that I'm sure uh, has many uh, many sides to it. Yeah. So it, it's actually an interesting point, actually, to make at this, uh, at this junction that um, sometimes our choices are driven by sort of theoretical considerations of what's sort of the right thing to do given the data. And sometimes the choices are driven by numerical considerations and what is actually feasible. And so there may be methods that are very nice theoretically, but that uh, numerically are unstable or don't work well with certain classes of function approximators or certain classes of, of uh, these hypotheses. And so we're going to make a choice, even if it's not quite theoretically justified, but the one that actually works in practice. So that, that's, a, that's a trade-off as well. Yeah? When you say that logistic this graph, or, or can you? So, so the generative models uh, means that you can actually use the model to generate data. Okay. So, in other words, uh, I could use this. You know, can I use this model to actually generate you inputs and outputs? Okay. So the question is: Is, is logistic regression a gen why is logistic regression not a generative model? So, in logistic regression, what I can do is if you give me an input. I can infer the output. Okay? With a probabilistic assumption on the weights, I could even infer a distribution of the output. What I cannot do is invert that and say, given the output, what does the input look like? Okay? Now, there's a large literature on generative models. Naive Bayes is the typical example, sort of simple classifier example of a generative model, where you can actually generate both inputs and outputs. Okay? When is that interesting to do? It's interesting to do when you actually want to generate data. Okay? For example, if you want to generate text or you want to generate images, then it's good to have a generative model. The other thing is that it uh, allows you sometimes a way to supplement your data okay, under certain circumstances by, by generating more examples. Uh, so logistic regression is, typically, is a typical discriminator. Given the input, you can compute the output but you cannot invert that computation. Uh, if we make different assumptions here on the structure of this graph, so really the problem comes from this node over here where we then apply a threshold. Okay? So once we add a random variable and we apply a threshold, the information about that random variable is completely gone. If instead we have some other probabilistic assumption here about how this output is, is generated, then we can actually perhaps invert that. Okay? And so Naive Bayes has some different assumptions that it works under specifically. Its assumption is like this. You have an output here, and it generates inputs. Okay, and then we can sample this way or sample that way, conditioned on anything. Okay, and end up data. Okay. Yep. Uh, when you were talking about the bias variance trade-off for the perturbation, what was the expectation over? So the expectation is always over the true probability of the data. So p is the P is the true probability of the data, so the one that's generating the inputs. So sampling different training sets. Yeah. In the very, very beginning, you mentioned that uh, P zero net is a parametric model. Is there such thing as non-parametric P zero net, and there's no assertions? <clears throat> so I will give you now my uh, my own view of this, which may be completely uh, off kilter, but uh, you know, Joshua and Aaron can correct me if I'm wrong. My own view is that these are very large parametric models, so large that you actually don't need the non-parametric stuff at all. So what you do is you essentially over-parameterize. You have a very large parameter space. You can com represent very complicated hypotheses. And then you're smart about the way that you do the search in the space. 
And so you avoid overfitting problems by being smart about the optimization. And as a result, you don't really need the non-parametric stuff at all because you build a very large model to begin with. Now, will there ever be a need to have something non-parametric? Non uh, if you had even more data, I don't really know. There is something that's fundamentally very nice about parametric models, which is that you have a handle on the complexity. Okay? And so the, the, the parameter size is given. Whereas in non-parametric models, potentially you can memorize data and the model can grow very unwieldy. And then you have to, you know, the theory is nice, but in practice you have to do things like throw stuff out and forget and so on. And so, uh, you know, at least in my view, parametric models are a little bit better. And they're, since they're so big, yeah. So I agree with Doina's answer, but I would add this. Uh, Non-parametric, for me, at least for many people, means that uh, you, you learn an algorithm can adapt to the amount of data. So you have more data, you can you know, put more capacity. Um, in, in fact, that's what we do with uh, neural nets and other things like mixture models. And even though, given the number of units or the number of mixture components, it's a parametric model, in practice, you will actually choose the, the, the size of the model depending on how much data you have. And so these models really are non-parametric. Not the usual non-parametric, but they are non-parametric. So is there any theory that's been, that has looked into the sort of parametric, non-parametric interpretation of, of deep nets at all? Well, of course. I mean, all the universal approximation properties of neural nets is really about saying, as the number of parameters grows, you can approximate any distribution. So you basically have all the same characteristics of standard non-parametric methods that you can approach the true data, the true function as the amount of the data and capacity grow to infinity at the right rate. So, so there's no such thing as, so let's say you start with a very tiny neural net and with a large data set, and the neural net somehow grow in a non-parametric yes. fashion so that it there. stops at a so there have been historically a lot of methods that do that very explicitly. Back in the 90s, there was a whole literature on growing neural nets and adding units and noticing that units are unhappy and oscillating and cutting them up into pieces and so on. I think that is that the current methods that we use make that unnecessary. And so the, the, you know, the current methods are more elegant. The optimization is better. And so we don't need to do this kind of hacking of you know, we add something, we remove something, and so on. So I have two questions about the regression. Uh, the way that you demonstrated the regression, uh, sorry, I mean uh, the regularization. Uh, the way that you demonstrated the regularization is just uh, to decrease the variance of the uh, hypothesis. So first question is, if we have enough data, do we need regularization or not? The second question is, why regularize the network when we can just decrease the size of the hypothesis and the number of problems or something? Okay, so, so first question is, uh, in the, if we have a lot of data, do we need regularization? And in principle, in the limit of infinite data, you don't. Okay? Because in the limit of infinite data, if you think of regularization as a sort of Bayesian prior, the prior is going to wash out and you're going to do max likelihood on that, that data. Okay? However, we never have an infinite amount of data. We always have a finite amount of data. Therefore, in practice, it is always a smart idea to use some form of regularization. Okay. Um, the second question, uh, can you repeat that? <laughs> Sorry. If, it's, if the goal is just to decrease the variance, uh, right. we are just not dropping the size. Yeah, so, so why not just uh, drop the size rather than do regularization? And uh, the, way, the way I think about it is that you want to control the size of the hypothesis space, and regularization gives you a very nice uniform way of doing that. Okay. And it has one parameter that you control. And that parameter essentially has a nice geometric interpretation, as we've seen. And so you know, it's all good. You kind of let the algorithm decide how many things it needs in there. You could. You could control the number of units. But then the overfitting phenomenon does not always come as a this direct sort of uh, connection with the number of parameters. There are other things that come into play as well. Okay. So for example, if you have certain types of units in deep nets, things like sigmoids, you can uh, have saturation. Okay. Saturation essentially means that you can't move those units anywhere. 
Okay, you're memorizing whatever you had in the past. You can't adapt anymore to uh, future data. So that's a form of uh, sort of, let's call it overtraining, not quite overfitting, uh, that regularization can help you avoid, um, you know, because your weights shrink and then your parameters are more free to move. So there's other reasons for doing this kind of thing, uh, not just, uh, you know, and not just controlling for numbers of units specifically. So I would add that in the last few years, it's been pretty obvious that what works really well is to have huge geomets. Uh, that are regularized one way or another, usually by injecting noise. Uh, and, and that just works much better than having you know, tightly parameterized models for reasons that may be due to optimization. But we should stop here and thank Doina.